ningekuwa taxi driver ningekupa lifti Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here and I'm going to be presenting a review video for chapters 4 through 6 and hopefully this will help us to make up some ground because of course we've missed some time in class and our next exam will actually be, if you look on the schedule, Our next exam is going to be March the 12th, so we still have quite a bit of time uh, before that. We have uh, a couple of weeks, uh, but I also want to make sure that we're pacing ourselves so that once the next exam comes, we'll have uh, covered the material that uh, what we need to. As you can also see, we have our case that will be submitted on Thursday, that is an adjustment from what is on the schedule where you see the 25th, but I've decided to move it back to the 27th. That way we can give uh, Kristen Harper a chance to address us and give us some insight as to the inner workings of Hershey's and some of their global initiatives. So hopefully you all have been looking at the the case that I have uh, given you a couple of weeks ago, this case here, which is Hershey's battle for global sweet tooth market. And as we've learned, this is a very fiercely contested market. I have learned quite a bit uh, during the last uh, couple of weeks in looking at the confectionery industry. There is a, a lot of data uh, that is available. And of course, you have data that you can find. This data, it comes from a link. Uh, but of course, if you want a, a thorough account of the confectionery market, then you have to pay for it, as you can see in the upper right hand corner the purchase options. Lots of detail here and you may want to check to see if you can gain access uh, to this information through your student account. It may be possible, I'm not sure, or you may be able to find information similar uh, to what is presented here. But there is a, a, a lot of uh, information on the confectionery industry and hopefully uh, Kristen can give us some enlightenment uh, on this. So also on Tuesday, you'll have an opportunity to ask Kristen uh, questions pertaining to Hershey's, the market of the confectionery industry, and also maybe some questions as to how you would uh, approach your own project. Um, I hope to uh, speak to her before she meets with us in class in order to give her some direction as to what it is that we're trying to accomplish. But as you can see, this is a uh, kind of a, uh, a mini case. It's not a full-blown marketing plan of any sort, but it will give you some exposure as to uh, the company Hershey, the confectionery industry, and the three global markets that we have select it. What I have for you today is the review of chapters four through six. And our next exam uh, was scheduled to be from chapters four through eight. I'm not sure if we're going to make it that far, but um, be that as it may, uh, we're going to try to make up some ground. And on Tuesday, uh, we'll have our case um, well, we'll have our, we'll discuss the case on Tuesday with Kristen Harper, and then on Thursday you will present the case, and um, perhaps uh, if you want to give a short presentation of what you found, that is totally uh, acceptable um, uh, for you to do that. Um, I will give more detail on 
the what I'm expecting for Thursday. And uh, but hopefully you've made some some progress. So anyway, uh, here is the video. Hopefully you're able to get through it. You can always stop, pause the video and pick back up where you left off. Again, this is chapters four through six and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. So chapter four is dealing with social and cultural environments. And if you haven't learned anything else in this class, you've learned that these environments are so important. Regardless of what Dr. Levitt has stated, and he wrote a very important article called Globalization of Markets, which we read and talked about. And that article written in 1983 has been debated ever since. And we're talking 35 years now that that article has been uh, used as, as kind of a, uh, a discussion piece for globalization. And I think we can agree to a, to a great degree that culture and this, this idea of the, this uh, social cultural environment is still very, very important. I did, uh, I believe I, I showed you uh, a couple of articles that I found and these articles showed the impact of globalization on culture. And if you took me for, I think it was Global Business, where we, we showed the movie that dealt with outsourcing and the impact that it was having on India in terms of its taste for consumer items. Here we have a, an article about Ghana Deal, dealing with an, an obesity issue. And this is becoming a, a very uh, serious problem in developing countries. We talk about Vietnam and KFC, and we already know the how that landscape is. The KFC has 21 stores or more than 20 stores in Vietnam. They have one McDonald's. They have a handful of Subway stores, uh, but this idea of rising disposable income and young population is creating a combination that is resulting in some serious challenges as far as health and nutrition is concerned. And so here in Ghana, West Africa, you have a situation that may surprise uh, many of the, of the people that come across this article. I recently read a similar article about South Africa suffering the same um, problems. Uh, also Kenya, there was uh, several articles on China uh, having to deal with this uh, issue. And why are they dealing with this issue? Well, we talk about culture and I'll, what I'll do is segue into the, the chapter when we talk about culture, and I won't go through the whole um, chapter in, in terms of explaining all the details, but I think we understand that uh, culture is, uh, is dynamic and it does change. And there are a number of forces that can impact a culture, a cultural shift. And some of those are internal, some of them are, are external. Uh, but one of the things that you, you find is this kind of external influence is something that has taken the world by storm and created taste for many different types of products. We're not only talking about fast foods, but we're talking about music and clothing and appliances, cell phones, and all of the things that we associate with being uh, a contemporary society or a developed society. And you see a lot of issues in terms of culture, cultural shifts, cultural erosion. And some may say, well, this is straight up 
cultural imperialism, that you are exporting these tastes to other cultures. And as far as obesity is concerned, many of these countries are not equipped to handle the effects of obesity, which gets into diabetes and uh, all of these other chronic ailments that come with um, obesity. So culture is certainly one of those things that is uh, complex. And here are the components of culture. This is from another textbook. But you can see how complex culture is. One of the things that's changing with culture is the fact that you have a lot of immigration. Places like the U.S., in Europe, you have an influx of, of migrants that come from different countries, and they also bring their own culture with them. So how, in fact, does that change the culture of the place they're going? That's a very good question, because then that begins to change what, when we, when we talk about Hofstede's framework, in Hofstede's framework, you can find that on page... 119, and that's something that you should be familiar with, Hofstede's framework, where there are six dimensions. The book gives you five. It started out as four. He added uh, a fifth dimension. And then in 2010, he added a sixth dimension, which was indulgence versus restraint. So make sure you add that to your notes, that there are actually six dimensions to the Hofstede's framework. And I believe Brittany had uh, mentioned that. Um, so that was uh, certainly a, a heads up for us and gives us uh, kind of a affirmation that books sometimes um, are outdated. Uh, I'm not sure why they didn't catch this because the sixth dimension was added in 2010 and this book is copyrighted in uh, I think it's 2017 or 2016 so they should have made that adjustment. But be that as it may, we certainly have uh, caught it and so to our um, benefit we can we can certainly um, be up to date with the uh, the trend of his uh, research. So Geert Hofstede defines culture as a collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one category of people from those of another. I have some issues with uh, his framework. One of the issues that I have with his framework when I first read it is the fact, and I showed this in class, that he had categories of countries that were lumped together. Arab countries, East Africa, West Africa, and then he would have all the other separate countries. Now, there are many problems with that, and I pointed out that in many of these regions, like if you say Arab countries, Arab countries are very diverse. Yes, they're predominantly Muslim, but they have diversity just as you have diversity in Africa, where you have 54 countries, all of them very diverse in terms of their culture, their history, their associations with other nations, and their levels of development. So it's, it's certainly, um, uh, I, I believe, very dubious if you lump these countries together and say, well, that's East Africa, that's West Africa, those are Arab countries. And the other thing that was mentioned in some of the uh, critiques of the Hostess framework is that it did not account for gender. And we know that gender is uh, one of those factors that uh, is, is very uh, it, it plays a big role when we talk about culture and societal norms. And so that's changing as well. But uh, there are critics of the framework, but it, it still remains a, a very important point of discussion. When we talk about these ideas of standardization versus customization and then Hofstede's framework and some of these other theories that come into play, they're very important for discussion, and we may disagree uh, with them, or we may agree, but they're certainly uh, very important. So again, we have a number of different factors of culture. Again, I won't go through all these, 
Uh, but these these are factors that you should know. Uh, the graph that I showed earlier with all the different components of culture, you got obviously social institutions and social structure, which um, here says reinforce cultural norms. Of course, the family being the most, I guess you can say the the one of the most important units because that's going to be set the stage for how society grows and, and how it prospers. And obviously your educational system, religion, government, and business also play uh, very important roles. You should be also familiar with physical culture. We live in the United States, which is a material culture. We place a lot of value on materialism and the importance of things. And, and so it becomes very uh, interesting when you look at how the, these cultural shifts are taking place in other uh, developing countries and with now the increasing desire or increasing demand for certain brands of clothing and uh, music and electronic appliances and all of these things are uh, having an, an increase, increasing importance. Then you have the abstract culture, which is the, those things that were uh, shown on that graph and attitudes and beliefs, manners, customs, perceptions, and religion um, also play a very big role in terms of this, this uh, cultural framework. There are lots of agents of culture. We talk about some external forces. Uh, we have media forces such as satellite. We have internet, of course. We have uh, television shows, which uh, obviously is is um, those are exported. We have tourism. We have exchange programs where students go abroad and they live for a while, and then they bring that culture back with them. So we have a number of these different factors that influence culture and may play a role in changing the attitudes, beliefs, and values of a culture as these things are taking place. Of course, there are subcultures. We are part of a subculture. If we talk about the African-American community as part of a subculture, we have the overarching culture and then we have a subculture and then there are sub subcultures of within our community as well. So these are these are factors that you should uh, certainly uh, be aware of. The, the impact of uh, aesthetics and color. Uh, it is very interesting this idea of color because uh, in principles of marketing there, there's a, uh, a chapter on consumer behavior and in my class, I show the psychology of color, which is very deep because colors have an, an, an effect on, on how we absorb information. And they have, in some con cultural context, they have a, a, a specific meaning. Now, it is interesting, in an article that I read about McDonald's in Israel, Israel, we know, is a Jewish country. And one of the things about Orthodox Judaism is that there is a prohibition against mixing meat and dairy products. And so McDonald's has decided that they were going to change their branding to suit the uh, kosher prescription for Jews. And so this is this is what you have for that uh, situation. And I'll just read um, quickly. McDonald iconic quote unquote golden arches are being trumped by the blue and white of Israel's flag after the hamburger chain bowed to pressure from Tel Aviv's chief rabbi to distinguish its kosher restaurant and save religious Jews from accidentally chomping on a cheeseburger. 
the international chain's instantly recognizable red and yellow and red signs have been scrapped at two branches in Tel Aviv in favor of the McDonald's name in blue and white in Hebrew and the word kosher alongside. So that's a very, very interesting uh, development. And I remember years ago reading an article about McDonald's challenges in, in Israel and kind of similar to the same challenges of uh, uh, of India. I mean, McDonald's went in India, of course, uh, in India, they don't consume beef. It is actually against the law to slaughter a cow. And so they had to figure out a menu uh, adaptation and uh, and they have actually done very well as, as far as uh, that is concerned. And so this one is uh, uh, is also a, a very good example of how religion and uh, culture play a role in how a company will adapt, uh, make an adaptation to its um, product offerings. We mentioned music. Music is certainly a global phenomenon. Uh, there's lots of great music out there. I don't think Americans are exposed to uh, much of the music that's available. If you ask a typical person on the street, what are the top five songs in England or France or the Netherlands or Nigeria or Malaysia, they wouldn't be able to tell you. But most of the people around the world will know the top songs in the U.S. because the U.S. still uh, remains as this this hub and this standard for music production. Although there are great musicians all around the world and great singers, you can see that there's now a a fusion of a lot of music forms. Hip hop has taken the world by storm. You have different forms of reggae. Uh, they they don't mention here, but reggaeton which is a, another form that has been adopted in uh, Central America and in the Caribbean. You have uh, other forms of music, uh, salsa, uh, zook music, compass, bossa nova. I mean, these are all music forms uh, that are have taken uh, some, some um, uh, it's, it's taken on some international uh, acceptance but still it's a, a long way to go. But certainly hip hop is, is a music form that uh, has taken on different forms as it travels around the globe. Here we have, uh, again, some of the issues in terms of dietary preferences. I mentioned McDonald's. Domino's uh, also had a situation where they went into India. And here's an article, How Domino's Reinvented Itself to Win India. And it, it goes and it talks about the locations, the, the menu, and dist here, distribution and delivery. So Never. certainly the adaptation of the marketing mix was certainly apparent um, here in this case. Some of the other things that you should know are in terms of Language, you have spoken and unspoken gestures, or in some books they say verbal and nonverbal. You know, unspoken languages are gestures, thumbs up, you know, these types of signs. Um, you know, you got different ways of beckoning people. You have uh, facial gestures, you have insults, you know, people, you know, flipping somebody off and using different fingers to to indicate that you're disgusted with someone. And it varies from culture to culture. It used to be that the thumbs up was a very obscene gesture, but now it has taken on a kind of a univer universal meaning that it's something good. You give the thumbs up, that means something good. And certainly when we talk about spoken language, that's important because of uh, when you're marketing, then you, you have to have translations. So here, uh, they talk about Chinese and how you have these translations. And with in, 
in particular, China would be exceedingly difficult because there are so many characters and the English language does not accommodate all of those characters. And so it would be very difficult to, to find the equivalent meaning in, in some instances. And they've even made up names um, to accommodate kind of slang terms in, um, in American football. You should also know about high and low context cultures, what those mean and how they apply. And here's Hofstede's framework. Again, there is a sixth dimension. And that sixth dimension is indulgence versus restraint. And these are all dimensions looking at, in a cultural context, uh, how a country fares in, in terms of this, uh, this factor. We talked about self-reference criterion that is judging another culture based on your own views, based on your own cultural views. And it's very easy to do. And we do that quite a bit. We look at something, when we look at aesthetics, for example, and we see somebody with a lip plate, as we saw in Black Panther, we saw a lot of different aesthetics going on we see scarification, people scarring their bodies, face paint, uh, people shaving their teeth, piercings on the ears and different parts of the body, different hairstyles. And we may look at it, we may find it to be grotesque because we're not used to that kind of cultural model. And again, that self-reference criterion, we are kind of making a comparison of other cultures based upon our own. Then we have this diffusion theory, how quickly you're able to adopt the process that to adopt a product. And we go through this idea of awareness, being aware, being interested, evaluating something, trying something and then adopting it. And then of course you can skip steps as well. You can go from awareness or immediately to adoption. And the other phases are accelerated. I mentioned the example of going into a store and finding uh, a, a, a basket of snacks for a sample. And then you look at it, you're aware of it. You weren't aware before, but now you're aware of it. You try it, you go all the way down to trial, and then you adopt it. You may adopt it. Here you have the adopter categories. We mentioned the, the different... Um, the different names, the innovators being the ones that will stand in line, or wait from 4 in the morning up until 9 at, uh, in, in, in the morning when the store opens to get the latest iPhone or to get the latest pair of, of shoes, um, you know, athletic shoes. And so, yeah, those are the innovators. And then you get those who are right after them. And you have some people who still haven't seen Black Panther. Those would be the laggards, probably the laggards at this point. And we're already almost a, a month, a month into that movie being. Um, I believe the movie was released February sixteenth, and this is March the seventh. So we're almost at that uh, one month mark, and it's already uh, close to one billion dollars of of gross uh, receipts. So I'm going to go on to chapter five, and this is dealing more with the other aspects of the pest analysis. And this is political, legal, and regulatory. So that's the P. And it starts out talking about sovereignty. And why is sovereignty important? Well, sovereignty is the idea of a, a body that has the authority to govern that uh, to govern that country, and that is important because it is that entity that that sets the the laws for commerce and for that business environment, establishing the rules. So that is indeed very important. You obviously have this idea of trade. One of the things that's important to note is that 
corporations operate in a sovereign entity, whether that's the United States or whether it's a foreign market, they operate within a sovereign entity and they have to follow the rules of that sovereign government. In one case, dealing with Walmart, Walmart had a store in Canada that had Cuban products. Now, the U.S. has an embargo against Cuba, which means there's no trade between the two countries. A Walmart executive goes up to the Canadian store and says that they have to take all of those Cuban products off the floor. The store manager said, okay, we'll do that, but we'll also have to confer with our lawyers. So in the meantime, they took all the Cuban products off the floor. They conferred with the lawyers. The lawyers checked all the laws and came back and said that we are within our rights to have Cuban products in our store. Despite the fact that it's an American store, they are under the jurisdiction of Canadian law. And we are within our right to have Cuban products in a Canadian store. That gives you an idea how sovereignty plays a role in, in what's allowed in that business environment. We know about political risk and you can check many different um, guides for assessing political risk, institutional investor, Euro monitor. I think the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit has uh, these charts to assess political risk uh, and their indices that rank countries based upon you know, some factors. And these are some of the factors here that you look at that uh, when you're assessing risk. Of course, we know about taxation and what's um, current in the news is that President Trump wants to raise tariffs against uh, those who are bringing steel into the United States. He wants to assess a 25% tariff on steel and aluminum. So you also have this idea of um, government taxation in terms of on the consumer level, on the corporate level, and all of this has uh, a function because the government will provide, will use those uh, tax revenues to provide for a much smoother environment for business and pr protection for consumers. What are some of the other things? Uh, you should know these three things, expropriation, confiscation, and nationalization, which are uh, risk, the possible risk that um, you would take. Nationalization is what Fidel Castro did. Uh, he took American properties after the revolution, uh, which is what precipitated the embargo that exists between the U.S. and Canada. Actually, the U.S. is has assessed the embargo. Cuba does not have an embargo against the U.S. It's just unilateral. It's the U.S. having the embargo against Cuba, so there's no trade allowed. This idea of uh, expropriation, expropriation is when you when you take property, but you offer compensation for it. And creeping expropriation is uh, another form where you may uh, place restrictions on certain activities. It mentions here the repatriation of profits or sending money that you make from that company back to your home office. Sometimes there are restrictions that, that you can only uh, repatriate only so much because what happens if a if a company is putting their profits in a bank and they decide that they want to take all of those profits at once and move them back to the home office that creates a shock in the economy because those banks as you know don't keep enough money on hand for its deposits for all the deposits they only keep a percentage and they loan everything else out 
So if you take all of your money out of a bank and send it back overseas, it creates a shock in the system and that, that, that bank is exposed. So a lot of governments will restrict the amount of money that can be taken uh, out, of the, out of the country. You have all of these uh, what are considered, um, uh, th these are considered protectionist barriers. Of course, there are lots of different treaties. I won't go through all these different treaties, and this is where you would go to settle certain disputes. You could also go to the WTO if you're a country or if you're a company and you feel that you're being mistreated. You can go to your government, and your government can, can file a case with the WTO, and it would be up for arbitration. Now, this is uh, International Court of Justice, which is uh, slightly different. I'm surprised they had this that they had this uh, uh, in the book as opposed to the WTO but uh, it's certainly um, one one uh, recourse for resolving disputes common versus civil law Islamic law you've heard of Sharia and this very very comprehensive uh, legal code for particularly in Islamic societies. And it's not just punitive, well, where if somebody steals something, we'll cut their hands off, or if they, you know, we'll exact this kind of punishment, but it covers so many other areas. It covers finance, it covers marriage, it covers child custody issues, it, uh, it covers you know, all kinds of issues as it pertains to an Islamic society. And I think when you hear Sharia law in the U.S., it means automatically means something bad uh, but it's it's simply a way to govern Islamic societies to protect the citizens from danger and from 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 harm um, not only harm from individuals but harm from companies and other entities you have your IP issues intellectual property patents trademarks and copyrights which I believe I showed a, a video in class where you had examples of piracy which is very prevalent in a lot of countries and something that you will have to deal with if you have innovations or if you have a franchise like or young brands you know in that video which was titled the 15 worst knockoffs if you look at that video again it had all of these examples of egregious violations and I mean, what can you do? What can you do? You can go to the government and complain. Now your intellectual property should be protected, but it is up to the government to reinforce the laws protecting your intellectual property so that others cannot steal it or use it without authorization. Again, lots of different treaties. There's a lot of typos in this, uh, in, in this set of slides. They misspelled nurturing earlier, and here's should be mission. So I may have to go and spell check the publisher's slides. Antitrust means that you want to ensure that there are no uh, mon monopolies, and, and so there's there's antitrust measures against that, which doesn't apply in some countries because of the the nature of the government, the role the government plays. Here's some, some of the cases of antitrust rulings. Uh, there are a couple of others that uh, come to mind. Uh, Microsoft was part of a, uh, an antitrust ruling, as well as, um, I believe it was uh, AT&T, when they had to break up into all those baby bells. It was accused of being um, a, a monopoly. Of course, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1977, which and and that act covers everything. I, I I read it, and it covers just about every situation that could be conceived as being corruption or bribery. So it doesn't leave anything open to interpretation. Here's the corruptions ranking, and they have these in many different uh, many different uh, organizations carry these scores and they use a number of different factors to determine the ranking of each country. <clears throat> I 
and you also notice that the U.S. is not in the top 10 for least corrupt. The United States isn't in the top 10 as far as least corrupt countries. Which begs the question, what is corruption? Because if you look at corruption, the scale of corruption that occurs in this country is very large, and we're talking billions of dollars. We're not talking about the countries on the right where you see South Sudan, Somalia, Libya, people coming up to you asking you for money, or if you go into a store, somebody wants a bribe, or you know they want they want to um, they want you to pay for a favor, or you're in an airport and then some something happens and in an airline agent comes over and says you're about to miss your flight. Let me take you through the process and just you know give me a nice tip and okay these things happen in the open but when you talk about corruption on a large scale you have to look at some of the richer nations that are involved in these mass uh, scandals and we're talking billions of dollars so I think we have to kind of look at corruption in a more comprehensive lens and I'm not sure what constitutes corruption here but certainly um, Many countries who are considered rich nations involved in uh, corruption at very high levels. We just don't see it because it's it's under the table as opposed to many of these African, Latin American, Asian countries, Middle Eastern countries. The corruption may be more visible and so it's easier to count. So I'll move on to chapter six. And this was, we were talking about this idea of research and we were talking about computer systems and how computer systems are set up to provide a reservoir for data that's coming in about consumers. We have intranet here, which is the private network of a company. We have an extranet, which is not mentioned here. But when I was working with an e-commerce group in Atlanta, we were involved in something called EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. And this interchange typically occurs between a company and suppliers. So you have this electronic data interchange where you have uh, requisitions, you have orders that are made between companies, and you have this EDI taking place. And that occurs in some cases within an extranet, which meaning you have two companies, they both have private networks, but they allow the other company access to their private network. So that's an extranet. Extra means outside of. So you have all of these different arrangements, but particularly for companies with a um, that has a high volume of sales, you want to be able to track those sales and you want to be able to run queries uh, in, in terms of understanding the flow of uh, consumer habits, you want to be able to, to look at trends, buying trends. You also want to be able to look at, uh, in, in terms of the volume of what people are buying. CRM, we've learned about that in Principles of Marketing, Customer Relationship Management, which is a way to use that data, massage the data to come up with different profiles and patterns so that you can suit that customer in a very uh, responsive way. Some of the articles that you did for your journal pointed to a lot of different techniques that are being used with neural marketing and some of you all mentioned the idea of surveying consumers has taken uh, uh, it's, it's on a different level because you have more this this um, idea of responsiveness of of getting um, feedback from consumers long gone are the days where we're just relying on paper surveys to do that if you go on a, a flight you may get a survey back asking you how your experience was on that flight 
and you go through and then you click on certain numbers and then that information is goes into some database where they compile it and they figure out ways to improve their their service this idea of direct sensory perception if you're in another country seeing feeling hearing smelling or tasting firsthand to find out what is going on in a country and it is true that there's no substitute for that but it is with some caveat or with a warning that you want to ensure that you don't fall prey to self-reference criteria when you're observing because you can be in another country and observe something thinking that is one thing but that it really means something else in global business sometimes I give this example and it's it's um it's quite an interesting uh, a example when I was living in Chicago I attended an international event and there were people from all over the, the world in this at, at this event and I was sitting down in the kind of the, the hallway area and I saw two men walking past and they were holding hands and they appeared to be from the Middle East. And I knew this because I knew who they were. And but I did a double take and, you know, I knew it was something different. And I kind of knew it was a cultural thing because it's not something that you uh, would see in the U.S. Uh, and, and this was. This had to have been uh, 30 years ago. And so I did a double take and I didn't think anything of it. But years later, when I traveled to uh, Egypt, I saw that it was part of that culture where you had men holding hands, you had women holding hands, you had men arm in arm, you had a different type of communication that took place and it had no sexual connotation it had nothing to do with homosexuality it was just this is a way that I communicate my friendship and my feelings toward this person that I'm with so it's, it's, it's interesting because if you observe that you may think something else in 2018 you'll certainly think something else is going on uh, but in in the 30 years ago it was in you're in you're in Egypt, you see it everywhere. And it's observing that through your own cultural lens may uh, land you into a, um, an embarrassing situation. So that's one caveat when you talk about direct sensory perception. You have to make sure your SRC isn't overtaking um, you know, what the reality of the situation is. So we talk about formal marketing research. We talk about our objective. Our information requirement, is that information available? Is it feasible? You may want to do something, but do you have access to the information? I think I explained to you about my dissertation uh, situation. I wanted to collect data from a number of West African countries. I was warned about the situation and so I carried on and ran into some of the problems that we predicted. Uh, but as you can see, once you find out that the information is available, then you have to check for self-reference criterion under problem definition. Choose your unit of analysis as we're doing for our second case. Examine data availability. So you have secondary data, you have primary data, then Obviously, you have to figure out how much that your methodology is going to cost you. If you send out 2,000 questionnaires via mail, snail mail, it's going to cost you quite a bit. If you do this online, okay, the costs are probably negligible. If you do focus groups, then you have to pay the individuals. If you do interviews, then obviously there are drawbacks to that because they're harder to code. It's hard as code an interview, even though there are tools to, to do that today. Then you get into your instrument design in terms of your survey, making sure your questions are relevant, making sure you val validate your questions, making sure your pretest, which is not mentioned here in the graph, 
but pre-testing a questionnaire is very important. Meaning giving it to a few people, allowing them to fill it out and telling you, being honest with you of some difficulties they may be having in terms of answering the questions. So if they're having difficulties, you go back, you redo the question, then you reissue it to different people until the questionnaire is very go, going very smoothly. Then you get into data analysis, and then finally that data is turned into information in a report. So that, that's the research process. So you should be familiar with those uh, eight steps. And the steps are um, highlighted here. Now, I also want to reemphasize that when you're defining your problem, you want to be very precise and you want to narrow your problem down so that your data collection isn't all over the place and that your analysis isn't all over the place. It's very well defined and precise. Uh, here you have some examples of companies making mistakes because they didn't account for the cultural uh, uh, cross-cultural comparisons. Unit of analysis. In your second case, you have a region, but you can knock that down to a city. You can knock it down to uh, university. You can knock it down to various programs that you want to, to target for students to, to come and matriculate in uh, at Florida A&M. These are secondary data sources. So this secondary data is data that already exists. So it's rather easy to collect the data. It does not cost as much as say primary data but then there are issues of whether it's applicable, whether it's accurate, and whether it is current, whether it is something that you could actually use in your own analysis. These are some ideas in terms of the um, different methods you can use surveys, consumer panels, focus groups, interviews are all part of this uh, these options. I mentioned in class about the scale development. 10 point scale, 7 point scales, 5 point scales. The Likert scale here is the 5 point scale that we often see. And that's the one that's most accepted as kind of a a, a model that we understand and that in terms of stati statistical being uh, robust that we can rely on. In terms of sampling, what you will do in your project, your second case, is you will probably conduct a convenience sampling if you're doing surveys of any kind. Uh, if you're doing focus groups, if you're doing interviews, you're going to choose those students that are that are FAMU students and that can give you some insight as to what some possible approaches could be for recruitment. And then you have your various um, methods here, your data analysis methods, and I won't really emphasize those too much. So this is chapter seven, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. So in principles of marketing, you learn in that chapter about these three phases. Segmentation, when you segment a market, when you target, you decide on which one you're going to target. And when you position, then you take your product and you position it in the sphere of that particular segment. So you have demographic segmentation, which is, of course, we know age, gender, education, income class, uh, ethnicity, all of these things um, are considered demographics. In psychographics, you're talking about attitudes, you're talking about opinions, beliefs, and these type of things. Psycho meaning ha has to do with the way uh, you're thinking. So behavioral is, is uh, perhaps some of the, the, the ways that you 
uh, uh, your lifestyle, things that you like to do, which may or may not deal with age, may not may or may not deal with any of the demographics, but it may be based on how one behaves. And then you have benefit segmentation, which is um, we, we learned we learned a, a definition of value. So that was value was a benefit uh, over cost, right? And so when we talk about uh, benefit segmentation, we are talking about the approach is based on marketer's superior understanding of a problem a product solves, the benefit it offers, or the issue it addresses regardless of geography. Food marketers are finding success creating products that help parents create nutritious family meals with a minimal investment of time. So here we're talking about convenience products and we mentioned fast foods earlier. And so what benefit does that provide the consumer? Okay, you save time because you don't have to cook, it's quick, and it may be cheap depending on where, where you are. So you're looking at uh, obviously uh, benefits of fast foods, uh, convenience being one of the biggest value propositions for consuming uh, that type of cuisine. Here's the benefit segmentation again. Assessing market potential, you may apply this to your second case. Current size of segment, potential competition, and compatibility with companies' overall objectives and feasibility of successfully reaching the target audience. So you may look at this when you are talking about uh, your set, discussing your second case, looking at the potential size of the market, the competition, and also the, the compatibility of that market with what we have to offer. You have another situation, and I'll close on this, this thought, Standardization or undifferentiated target marketing. So those are synonymous, which means undifferentiated means homogenous. And we know from Theodore Levitt's article what this means. Mass marketing on a global scale, standardized marketing mix, uh, which reduces production costs, communication costs, because you're using the same message with for the same product globally. Then you have niche marketing, uh, which is concentrated. You have differentiated, which is more customized. And so you have, have these different ways in which you can seg segment a market. And then positioning means that you take that product and you put it in front of that segment and then you offer the value propositions, which can be the benefits, the values, the price, uh, whatever value proposition you want to offer that consumer, that is how you are able to position it.